Hello, my name is Glenn Thurston, and this is Dialing In. And thanks for dialing in again. I thought I'd start our first real episode, not that the other episode isn't real, but you know, our first real episode by introducing you to the Nikola Tesla of television, someone who you've probably never heard of, Philo T. Farnsworth. So if Farnsworth is the Tesla of television, then this guy named Vladimir Zvorykin, which I will mispronounce later multiple times because he's from Russia. Anyway, Vladimir Zvorykin is the Edison of television, and it's not like you've heard of him either. So this is a pretty obscure topic. Let's start out by going to the early days of radio in the 1920s. In Rigby, Idaho, the local high school, the science teacher is Justin Tolman, and young Philo T. Farnsworth often stays after class and draws on the chalkboard. He's actually in the advanced senior chemistry class and had to beg to be in the class, and turns out Tolman liked him enough, thought he was smart enough, and let him be in the class. So one afternoon, um, after when Philo T. Farnsworth is staying after class and drawing on the chalkboard, Tolman walks past and is curious about what Philo is drawing. And so he asks him, what are you drawing? And Farnsworth replies, it's an electrical system for projecting an image. Of course, Tolman's natural question, being an educator, is what does it have to do with our chemistry assignment? Oh, nothing. It's my new invention. So the idea that Philo had was a fully electronic television. And this distinction will come up later, and it turns out that this discussion that he had with Justin Tolman will end up being a very critical one. And we'll see that in just a few minutes. So what is fully electronic television? Well, see, at this time, television is already starting to be developed. In order to transmit an image over radio, which is essentially what television was back then, you have to send it one pixel at a time. And the common wizard of the time said that you should use a rotating or a vibrating mirror to scan across the image. But Farnsworth, as a 14-year-old farm kid in Idaho, realized that very soon you'd want to scan the image faster than you could move a mirror or physically make it vibrate, and that a mechanical process was a very serious limitation. And his solution was to use electric and magnetic fields. So Farnsworth gets his first big break in the form of George Everson and Leslie Gorell who are doing fundraising for a community chest in Salt Lake City just when Philo is starting a radio business with his friend after graduating, or I think they're about to graduate from high school. Community chest was, just as a side note, was something like United Way. Everson and Gorell convince him to move to San Francisco and set up a lab there. He marries his girlfriend, Pem, and gets on a train for California. Things are going well in San Francisco, and they're actually transmitting images from one room to another, in the fall of 1927. Moving pictures followed shortly thereafter the next year, and Farnsworth was able to secure, with the help of Everson and Gorell, additional financial resources from venture capitalists just in time for the Great Depression to hit. The Great Depression left just two people working on television in the entire country, Farnsworth in San Francisco and Vladimir Zvorykin in Camden, New Jersey. Well, Farnsworth was very excited about his work, and he often held demonstrations for his potential investors, as well as colleagues that he thought he could collaborate with. Uh, one of these demonstrations ended up being to Zvorykin, who, unbeknownst to Farnsworth, had been hired by the Radio Corporation of America, which you probably have heard of as RCA, to help them develop television. And RCA was a huge company at the time. They were in a patent pooling agreement with General Electric, Westinghouse, and AT&T. After the government had taken control of all the radio patents during World War I, they needed somewhere to return them to, and RCA was born. Zvorykin's visit was followed the next year, in 1931, by a visit from David Sarnoff, who was the head of RCA. Sarnoff was apparently sufficiently impressed by Farnsworth's work that he offered Farnsworth $100,000 to buy his company. But Farnsworth believed in electronic television and was looking to license his technology and collect royalties, so he declined. Later that year, Farnsworth entered into an agreement with the Philadelphia Storage Battery Company, better known as Philco, and you've probably never heard of them by either name, but he moved to Philadelphia to help them out. RCA brought a patent interference case against Farnsworth on May 28, 1932. They claimed that Farnsworth's 1930 patent infringed on a patent by Zvorykin in 1923, when Farnsworth was in high school. Farnsworth and his lawyers claimed that Zvorykin didn't ever make a working model of his patented idea and reduce it to practice, and they produced every 
evidence of every kind defending Farnsworth, and they even surprised RCA by producing the testimony of Justin Tolman, his high school chemistry teacher. And as part of his testimony, Justin Tolman even brought in drawings that he had saved from Farnsworth's high school notebooks, and they were dated 1922, a year before Zorikin claimed to have invented television. So, of course, RCA and Zorikin also put up a good fight, and they brought in expert testimony of every kind imaginable. In the end, though, Farnsworth wins on the grounds that Farnsworth had produced an electrical image, which was what the whole patent infringement case was about. That Zvorikin had patented an electrical image, but that Farnsworth's electrical image had actually been made and was not the electrical image that Zvorikin had defined in his patent. But RCA, of course, having pockets lined with money, appealed the case and dragged it on for another three years. But they eventually lost for good. In 1939, RCA and Farnsworth came to an agreement that RCA would license Farnsworth's patent, which is what he wanted in the first place, and they would pay him $1 million in royalties over the next 10 years. And the interesting part of this is that this is the first time that RCA had ever written a royalties check. Before that, RCA had charged royalties of other people for the, for the use of their patents. The problem was that this legal battle had cost Farnsworth more than he could possibly afford. That, combined with the beginning of World War II in 1941, made it so that Farnsworth could never really recover in the television business. But at least Farnsworth had the right vision of what television could become. Here's a clip from the only time in the history of the world that Farnsworth, the inventor of electronic television, was on electronic television. A 1951 episode of a show called I've Got a Secret, where a panel tries to guess why the person in front of them is famous. This is the famous Dr. Philo T. Farnsworth who invented electronic television. Doctor, truthfully, are you sorry? Uh, no, no. I'm not. Well, it's up to you. I asked him the same question. He said sometimes. <laughs> he said sometimes. Uh, now, uh, he is, of course, the uh, technical director of Farnsworth Electronics Company in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And, and sir, how old were you when you invented uh, television or, the, or the, the first television machine as we know it today, first television uh, system? I was 14. 14 years old. As I understand it, sir, let me say first of all that when I heard I was going to meet Dr. Farnsworth tonight, I expected an old man with a long gray beard. I just couldn't believe it. Now, uh, I'd like to ask you, ask you, there had been television sets of sorts before you came along, had there not been? Uh, yes, there had been uh, attempts to devise a television system using mechanical discs and rotating mirrors and vibrating mirrors. And but all mechanics, all, all me mirrors. All mechanical. And what was uh, your contribution? My contribution was to take out the moving parts and make the thing entirely electronic. And uh, that was the concept that I had when I was just a freshman in high school. He was the one who put electronics into television, which makes it possible for us to have whatever it is that we have now. And then, of course, as the machines developed, there were other people who made contributions, too. Oh, yes. Uh, there are literally thousands of uh, inventions important to television. And how many patents do you hold, sir, in the television field? Uh, I or hold electronics field? something in excess of 165 American patents. 165 American patents. Let's go from the past, sir, the not too recent past, to the future. What are you working on now? Well, uh, in television, uh, we're attempting first to make better utilization of the bandwidth because we think we can eventually get uh, in excess of 2,000 lines instead of 525. We're, uh, uh, and do it on even narrower channel, if um, possibly, than we're doing the present uh, television. Which will make for a better picture. Make, a a, picture. make for a much sharper picture. Then we hope, uh, we, we believe in the picture uh, frame type of a picture, where the, the uh, uh, v visual display will be just a screen. Then we hope for a memory, uh, so that the picture will be just as it was pasted on there, and many different kinds of, many improvements will result in the camera when you can use such devices because there's uh, part of the, of the scene that you can remember and you practically have a memory file of it and um, sim will simplify production of it.
Thank you for listening. This episode of Dialing In was recorded and produced in the city of Four Lakes, Madison, Wisconsin. Our appreciation goes out to Polyplus for releasing their music under a Creative Commons license. A special thanks to Donald G. Godfrey, author of Philo Farnsworth, the Father of Television, which was used as a main source in our research. Tweet or comment with ideas for future shows at GK Thurston on Twitter, on SoundCloud, or wherever the heck else you found this podcast. Thank you and good night.